All right, and as we start to wrap this up, I would like to discuss the film adaptation of Les Mis and the potential eventual film adaptation of Miss Saigon. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of your initial thoughts about Les Mis, the movie? All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, a theater production and a feature are so totally different, and I understand that there has to be changes made even if I don't agree with them. Sure. I think some of the casting for the Les Mis movie might not have been what I chose for well, it. Was it more gimmicky. I, I think it was more like this person has a famous name, so yeah. we'll cast him for it. Yeah. Um, I did. I don't want to say I didn't like Eddie Redmayne as Marius, but I didn't like the way he played it. It was just never my thought about what Marius. I, you know, no. I, I was, you know, I was a big fan of Michael Ball and. You know, he has that, like, sort of, it's it's so superficial, but just the dark mane of curly hair, he seemed more of a charismatic yeah. guy, and I feel like Eddie Remain is sort of that, and and this was before I saw Fantastic Beast, but he has that sort of <laughs> quirky, hipster, Yes, he's like sort of the hipster Marius, as opposed to sort of the student, not brawny per se, but has that sort of dashing... And I, I just don't feel like Eddie Remain sort of has that I kind of... I agree. You know, I think he mm -hmm. comes off a little, like... Uh, naive and immature, and, yeah. and that's not borderline whiny, yeah. even. Yeah, and that's and it's like both both of these girls are in love with this guy. Yeah. No, they wouldn't be. They would be in love with Angelus because I, that's, that's the yeah. Well, I feel like yeah. I feel like he has the looks, the appearance, the, um, the charisma. He's still not what I would have thought of as Marius, but no, between me the two, absolutely. Well, because I think Marius is supposed to be a very conflicted character who's passionate, and I feel like Eddie Romaine. I thought he did a really good job with empty chairs and empty tables. He had that part of it down, but it was sort of like the romantic element of it. He just seemed like whiny than conflicted or yeah. sort of like unsure of himself okay. when i i want marius to be more confident correct like when they sing um, a heart full of love yes okay. a heart full of love and he like kind of stops and is like i'm doing everything all wrong and it's it's like he's second guessing himself and in a more literal more, way yeah. like he literally is second guess what whereas right, marius right, is when, more about a nervous handsome energetic energy that he's sort of like it's I'm doing everything almost right. like a disney prince like yes, i'm doing I'm everything gonna... all wrong and instead he's kind of like i'm doing everything all wrong i was <laughs> gonna say i want my marriage to be more like a disney prince yeah yeah i you know i kind of i kind of agree with that i do agree though the gimmicky stuff you're right mm -hmm. like i feel like it was a gimmick to have these sort of names i think some of them worked out well i feel like hugh jackman was always going to get it because he's mm. the leading film star that could also be a musical star and i thought anne hathaway did a really good job as far as getting into the performance of fontaine who by the way though is not the lead character female character mm -hmm. anytime you've ever if, if you've looked up the wards in the past or the listings technically in the show eponine is the lead female character it's it's not cosette it's not fontaine i used to get in debates with this back in the day but it is eponine but anyway, it was all marketed to Anne Hathaway. And even if I had the Blu-ray DVD combo, and on the special features, the Blu-ray is the only one that talks at all about Samantha Barks. But if you watch the regular DVD features, it goes through cast, like, I forget what it's called, but it's like Casting Les Mis. And it goes through everybody except for Eponine. And I'm like, what? I mean, I remember when it was in theaters and you would see posters everywhere yeah. and Samantha Bar Barks wasn't Barks, on any. She didn't even no. get top billing at all. No. I, but but Anne Hathaway, because she has the famous name. Correct. I mean, I'm not the biggest Anne Hathaway fan. I don't really have a reason. I like her. But fine I loved her as yeah. Fontaine. She I was thought great. She was, I mean, she deserved that Oscar. I agree. She I agree completely. She was amazing. But and it well and maybe it's a sort of sexist Hollywood thing where it's kind of like well even though we're gonna Anne Hathaway's character she won for best supporting actress mm -hmm. and it's kind of like well we have this character we can't possibly focus on two women from this show you know we could do one woman we're gonna focus on it's gonna be Anne Anne Hathaway because she has the name but we're also gonna focus on Eddie Remain and Hugh Jackman and Russell Crowe and, and then Anne you know um, Amanda Seyfried's mm -hmm. like sort of look. But Cosette, just to the side, I, I do understand no, at Eponine. the end. That's Yeah, I'm sorry, Eponine at the end. I do understand at the end switching out from a cinematic look, having, because Eponine is usually who sings with Fontaine in the right. last song. I do think, and as much as I love Eponine, this was hard for me, but I do think it was the right choice to have the bishop come in at the end because Eponine in, in the movie, more specifically, does not have any sort of interaction that I recall with 
uh, Valjean, so why would he be thinking about her? But I do think that the bishop and Fantine would be the ones kind of singing that duet at the end. But it was like just another example when I'm watching it of like, yeah, Eponine's getting shoved to the side again. Yes, I agree. I side. agree that yeah. the way they um, chose to do that it made right. sense. Yeah. The way they restructured the movie, it made sense in yeah, the end. I do agree. Um, with myself, apparently. <laughs> That's not agree with you, but you're good. Anyway. Another <laughs> thing is there were a lot of songs that they would like chop one or two lines out that seemed to be maybe insignificant. Yeah. But like, I am really critical about things like this. And the one that bugs me the most is. The confrontation song between yeah, you're right. Oh, you're right. Yes, my God. I'm so glad okay. you said this. Yes, that is yes. one of my favorite songs. I love yeah. that song. Mm -hmm. I always try to get Paul to learn the Javert part mm -hmm. so that we can sing it. <laughs> and at the end, and this I swear to you tonight. There is no place that you can hide. Yes, you're right, though. It is. That whole part is cut out. And I remember seeing in the movie, like, still after the song was long over, after they had, like, the new song they added in, I was still waiting for it. I'm sure. like, they can't cut that out. It makes yeah. sense. It such sets a, up the whole rest of the movie. It's such a dramatic moment. And oh a movie that's about high drama, it is a very important moment and i remember thinking like because he they did the shock of him just jumping out the window at the thing i'm like okay that's fine then have him kind of be in the water still singing while javert's looking down then right. maybe they don't have, i've always you know obviously a picture of them he's on the floor ready to they're singing to each other and he leaves but i was like fine have that shocking moment but then what is it it's maybe 30 seconds of music i mean You're i don't even me. think it is but then the yeah. end when they sing it in duet i swear to you i will be there yeah. that line is so powerful it's very powerful it, it lingers mm -hmm. because it sets up the tone then for stars you know it's yes, sort of like yes. it bridges it's it's a thematic bridge to that moment later on mm -hmm. and you just cut that bridge off you know it just doesn't and you kind of get like valjean's like anxiety like the, yeah. He's, con he's, he's going still to be constantly running, yeah. running from this. Yes. He's going to be for his whole life. And it just broke my heart that they cut that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely will always be affected by the Eponine stuff, but I will agree with you that I think of all the cuts, that was maybe one that cut too deep. Like, it was a, a moment that's needed and lingers. It's, it, it's, a, it's, mm. it's, how do I say it? Like, when you go to see a, sh a movie, you know, you're watching everything on the screen, but there's certain things that linger out. And that's one of those moments that would have, like, had a little bit more of an emotional resonance with the audience mm -hmm. that you remember. I 100% agree. What else? Is there anything else about the uh, movie? I then? mean, just how they chopped up Eponine's Especially part. in a heart full of, uh, or a heart full of, no, what, a little fall oh, of rain. Oh, oh. In a little fall of rain, they have the, they skip the whole, and I, I get it's, you know, not a realistic thing where she, because she starts off like slowly dying, and then she's like, the rains above are heaven blessed. And she's like belting it and then comes back down quietly. <laughs> but I actually kind of think it is a realistic thing that if you're dying, you have that one last moment and then kind of come back in again. And it's like, oh, there they are cutting Eponine again. Yes, especially when she's like there with Marius. It's her and, moment. And she's yes. like, that would I think give her a little bit more of adrenaline God. to come back again and be like, I want to stay for this moment finally. And Except Eddie, Eddie Redmayne's face the whole time they're singing it together, and he's like smiling and like awkward, and I'm yeah. like, what are you doing? <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I and they cut off the beginning of On My Own and the beginning of On My Own. Oh, I did want to say about uh, A Heart Full of Love. Mm. Um, they cut the second verse of that song, and I was okay with it, and I thought it flowed better. And mm. now every time I hear like the full version, I think it drags. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm playing off time. I don't remember I'm cutting it. I guess you're right. They do though, because it does seem really short yeah, when it, it happens. Yeah, it flows there. better without the second verse. You just want. Well, maybe it's me because I just want to get to Eponine's part. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how I felt too. Well, and I mean, originally it was such a longer song to begin with. I think it, when you look at the original London cast, um, you know that song. It's called the Love Montage. It goes on for oh. like three or four songs, and then it finally got condensed down to because it was. Um, in my in my life, I think it starts off with mm. Cosette and uh, Jean Valjean segues over to this, but it was even longer. And then now it's kind of like half of what um, what it was, and then half of Heart Full of Love kind of kind of calm down. And it's still a little long. It's, yeah, it's long. I have to say that the London cast recording is like my least favorite one. The only reason I ever listened to that version is because of Patti Lapone oh, yeah. saying I Dreamed a Dream. And I love, I will always love, I guess it'll be the moment right now where she goes, but the tigers come at night. She does this little thing and I'm like, oh, I, like, I love little <laughs> moments like that are different. I do think though, I also agree, but I think that the, because uh, Frances Ruffell did Eponine for the original London and she did it for the original Broadway. Mm -hmm. 
And I do wish she had sung in the Broadway version the way she sang in London. She has a certain notation to her voice that comes off kind of whiny and like everything's like dragging. And I've heard her sing it live and she sounds beautiful. I, the London cast sounds very con controlled and contained, but yet still has that burst. I'm like, okay, that sounds beautiful. Something about the Broadway cast went very like... And I'm all alone. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. I, but the thing is, is I still listen to it because I, I love Francis for Lip Buffel and all that. But yeah, and I think uh, that stars the Broadway cast. I think Philip Quast, who did the Dreamcast Javert and was Australian Javert and is like the definitive Javert now, he definitely has the best voice. But actually, my favorite version to sing is the Broadway cast. Mine um, too. Terrence Mann, I think it is, or Terrence. Terrence Mann, he ended up playing Critters, the Critters movies. He was one of the, like... Oh, really? Yeah, one of the alien guys. But uh, something about the way he has a Javert, it's very smarmy, and I kind of like it. And the way he sings it, it has these sort of, like, little, I don't know, warbles in it that are kind of <laughs> fun. Yeah, I will say that probably London is... It, it almost seems like a rough draft copy of it. You know, it seems like it's... I feel like, like it, the way it sounds, it sounds like they're trying to almost, like be the next Phantom of the Opera, because it's very, like, electric guitar. Yeah, no, you're right. I always got that impression, too. You're 100% right. Yeah. And even some of the lyrics, uh, some of the song titles, I'm blanking right now, but yes, I remember thinking, like, oh, that's very reminiscent. And I feel like then Jekyll and Hyde also did that at some point, where it tried to do a little bit of Les Mis Phantom. <laughs> and eventually, when they are at their best is when they finally separate. Like, wait, like, no, we're yeah. not that show, we're this show. And then all of a sudden, it becomes the best version yeah, of it. Yeah, I agree. Would there be anything else as far as the Les Mis movie? I mean, I could go on, but those are the uh, main yeah, those are the main points. <laughs> Now, I would like to say that, you know, in terms of music, movie musicals, I always thought that Miss Saigon would be, like, the best movie musical. I think it has this nice contemporary feel that people can relate to. It has still music that, yes, it was created in the late 80s, early 90s sort of melodies, but I think they're, they're timeless in their own way. I always thought it was just, it would be a fantastic musical. The whole helicopter, all of that. Mm. But in terms of what I would like to see or not see, obviously the Ellen stuff, I have really strong emotions for. I just really hope that if they decide to make a film version, since they've analyzed her song to death, analyze maybe one more time and go back. I did enjoy uh, with this version, and I'm sure it'll be a lot easier to do with like a title card or this or that. But I felt this time when watching the show in Cleveland, they were more emphatic about making sure the audience knew that there had been a time jump. I think when I saw it, we, Danielle and I saw it way back when we were in high school. And I don't remember that still be, I knew it because I knew the show, but I don't think the general audience would have necessarily picked up there's time. I even enjoy as few as one of the few changes of the song. I love that they kept the melody, but and I still believe, I think they had this nice core, like the way Kim, the Kim's lyrics were changed into even more adding on just so you know, time has changed. <laughs> We've gone on a little, I still believe, you know. And before yeah, it was just, it's been a few years. right? <laughs> this wasn't last night. <laughs> um, and then, but I think, you know, before it was just one quick line. And in a public audience, there's always somebody that coughs. Uh. Like the show we saw this time, uh, Meg and I went and saw it, but we're not together. But mine, every dramatic moment, somebody got up to go use the bathroom. And it was literally like three or four minutes before intermission. I, I don't know if they were trying to beat the rush, although they were all men. So I'm like, what rush? It's the men's room. <laughs> there's no rush. There's no line. But they all kept getting up. And I'm like, wait a minute. So rude. This so is rude. a live production. Correct. There are people who are actually on stage. Yeah, yeah. And the, this isn't a movie. And I feel like in a moment, like if they kept the original lyrics to I Still Believe, very easily a cough or something you would have missed that uh, Kim was singing about a time jump. So I, I'm fine with those lyric changes because I think that they are they serve a purpose at least to make sure because Miss Saigon does it, it's, it's sort of there's a flashback sequence and these aren't things often done in musicals where you kind of you know, you start here, then you jump in time, then you learn what happened before. That had to have been really hard to sort of orchestrate when they were coming up with the show. But uh, still, I loved the whole, my favorite part of Miss Saigon. I think my favorite song is I Still Believe. Uh, my favorite love song is Sun and Moon. What's your favorite of the love songs? Um, the 
is it last night of the last, world last yeah, night of the world. yeah. Yes. which is the yes. big powerful yes. one i love sun and moon because it has this sweet tender quality but last night of the world is beautiful mm. and powerful and bum, 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 bum. and then i i think all that but the the moment for me that always gets me in this show is what we i think we talked about earlier is the the whole everything how they got separated yes, and the, the helicopter which i was worried about when we saw it the helicopter when we saw it in the past, it always kind of came up and then went back. And this time they had that sort of visual, like, lasery type thing. And I'm like, oh, is that going to be it? Because if that is, I feel like they've really gone oh. backwards. <laughs> and then they kind of lifted the scrim or the, the screen. And you saw the huge helicopter. And it was even better than it's ever been. It, was, was, ha- it was like hanging out of that thing. I'm like, he's going to fall. <laughs> oh, and when we saw, uh, I wasn't expecting this, but Miss Saigon, definitely. There was always a sexual suggestion in the in the musical. And you saw a few things. And when we first saw it, I was like, oh, okay, they definitely <laughs> went for it. But this time, I feel like they rammed up the sexual element. When they had, I was really uncomfortable <laughs> and I think right for when Kim was kind of like they had sort of bent her over the like table and I'm like I don't remember John doing this he may have but I don't remember being so in your face but speaking about things in your face I wasn't expecting we saw Chris's butt we did and I don't think we ever saw Chris's butt before and I was like <laughs> oh is that the light is that his pants no that's his butt right there on stage which just the section like no it was complaints. definitely it was very well defined, but it uh, and then even when he turned around and the light kind of came up and I was like, oh wait, and then I'm like, oh he's wearing his fatigues now. He must have slipped them back up. But I thought uh, it's definitely they rammed up the the sexual energy of the show, which is mm-hmm, needed. I for sure. I think that that's very much a big part of the show. I mean. It's lust. I think Kim and Chris genuinely fell in love, but it's definitely a lust is what brought them there mm-hmm. and. Not just that sun and moon, but also other things. And I thought it was uh, very well done. I would like to see that in a movie view- version, like the continuation of amping up that, the emphasis on time. But again, this was your first time seeing the show. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't know. You, for you, for a film version, I've been thinking about it for 20, 30 years, you know, um, 20 years. My opinion, I guess, I think it would make a great movie. I was, um, I mean, until I saw it, I was always kind of like, you know, wondering how it would work as a movie and seeing it on the stage, it was it was more emotional, obviously, yeah. than just listening to it. Yeah. Uh, I think it would really reach a wider audience as a movie. The whole feel of the show is so indicative of the time of the Vietnam War, and it's so melancholy. Yeah. And I think a lot of people in our generation don't really understand that because we didn't right. live through Vietnam. Right. Um, like when it first came out, Vietnam had only ended less than 15 years before, right, and it's right. been 35, you know. Everyone had like a point of reference. Years. Either you knew someone or your parents yeah. were there. A lot of that has been lost. People don't like to talk about it. It was, you know, the unwinnable true, war. True. It ended badly. And I think this movie, with all of its other storylines, around the war does a really good job of capturing the feeling of the time and the feeling of the people who were involved in the war. Well, I wanted to add to that specifically something you and I discussed before filming was what you said Paul had kind of reacted to and what you kind of followed up with was just how it is so melancholy and it is, I do think it would make the perfect movie musical, but people need to go in understanding that it is sad Mm -hmm. and it is not ending on a happy note. Right. Yeah, he was... He, he said if they made it into a movie, they would definitely have to change the end. And I said, no, that's that's what happened. That's well, I, what it was like. And I that's... think you get the West Side Story ending. I mean, that ends oh. on a very, you know, you have um, Tony and Maria. And then Maria, I mean, Tony dies. And it ends with Maria getting up and walking away. And then it's sort of when the credits roll, though, they, they kind of segue into the sad music. But then it kind of segues into the powerful happier moments of the musical just in the instrumental and i think that miss saigon would pull that off too like with the the engineer and who by the way i know i think jonathan price there was a lot of issues with him back in the day about being uh the engineer because the character is like supposed to be half french half uh vietnamese Mm. so he the the whole whitewashing of it is definitely problematic and was an issue but i could see their argument that jonathan price you know the character is half caucasian 
However, um, this engineer was brilliant. I loved him. I thought he was I so funny too. in your face. He did a lot of little ad libby moments that I thought were just brilliant. And so the engineer from the 2018 cast of Miss or 2019 <laughs> cast of Miss Saigon tour is was just brilliant. You did a good job. We loved you. But yeah, so I think you know they would end though on a sad note and just play some kind of music at the end to uplift it because you don't want to leave depressed necessarily. But overall, no, but I thought, it's a, it's an ending where you can like just sit with it for yes. a moment. I would love it to see the think. ending and then the screen go black. Just wait and sit with it for a minute because it's a lot. Um, another thing about the engineer, quick. Yeah. Um, I think it's so important for movie or for well movies, I guess, or musicals of uh, production um, to have a strong comic relief. Oh, and oh my, absolutely. he was so good. Yeah, he, just, he had I can't it nailed. Get over it. He yeah, had yeah, yeah, it yeah. nailed. And Every moment too. Yes. I never. He's never really a character. I I always would watch it thinking like, oh, like you know, I was in show choir and we always had guy guys in it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, they love it because of the engineer. I'm like, I like him, but whatever. But this time I was just as absorbed with him. Yeah. I was like, oh, I want to see him back on here. And it's tricky to do when like you know yeah. the audience is like has just seen this you know depressing thing and it's about war and you have to come in and like. To the clown. Eight, right. Sing about, and especially when you're singing about the American dream and you're being <sighs> very sarcastic about American values or perceptions. And because it is a British musical, right, you know, right. a French British musical talking about something that happened in Vietnam, but the American way of, you know, jumping in, which again, also, we didn't mention this with the Ellen thing, but that is the thing is that, you know, it's sort of like Ellen coming in. We, we don't end up liking these characters per se because we were not supposed to in terms of you know the u.s jumped into this war that it maybe didn't have any business being in and it's like these characters what they conveyed symbolically with ellen before and how chris turned out they they had this sort of symbolic element that like they're messing things up they're messing up kim's life with what they think is the best decision right. they're thinking like well we're we're i think chris even sings right before I'm American. How could I fail to do good? Mm -hmm. And then he he just kind of then acts like an American. And he's like, well, I'm going in to now fix this situation. I'm the hero. And it's like with and, and the Ellen song, all of that, her trying to become, when they try so hard to make her relatable, I'm like, well, you're failing because she's not supposed to be. And that is what makes her, that's her symbolic role. It's all a tragedy. The whole thing is right. a tragedy, even for the engineer, who is obviously trying to leech onto Kim and this story and ruining her life in his own way. He is a tragic figure as well. They all are. But, and I'd like that to be captured in the movie. Stop filling with it. Like Miss Saigon or like with Les Mis and suddenly mm -hmm. don't add in songs. Oh, we don't right. need for Academy of nominations that we might don't not pander. get. Yeah. Because yes, just you have this brilliant show. Why do you need to go in and fiddle with it? It'd be like, you know, Van Gogh going into a piece of art and being like, well, I never liked how that little bit looked, so I'm just going to... Now it's better. Right. You know, no. He has every right as the artist to do that, but why would he do that? Why? You, you, you had the show right. You had it right by the final Broadway performance. And that's, you know, and speaking of, you know, again, I, I feel like I wasn't um, as strong, talked about as much Lea Salonga, who, you know, is still one of my favorite Eponines and is by far the best Kim and will always be the definitive Kim. And I wish that they had made a film version of this a lot sooner. I guess I get some extent the, well, they don't want to take away from theater sales, but I think it's been demonstrated with Grease, Mamma Mia. You have these iconic films now and people are still going to see the shows and I feel like not, you know, Leia Salong is in her 40s now. I mean, she's beautiful. She looks, she, she still sounds the exact same, but you can't watch her on a film and think this is some 17 year old girl. Right. And I think they could have gotten away with it even until like the late 90s, you know, where she would have been in her, only about 25, 26, 27. I think she still could have pulled it off because if you watch in the final Broadway cast, I think that was in 2000, and she still looked amazing. I think they still could have, but now it's... Our, our our Kim was great. I felt sometimes she was a little... In a role that needs to be melodramatic, I feel like she was even too much melodramatic <laughs> at times. But, you know, and I felt like Leah Salong, that was just her role. You know, that was her role, and I, it's a For lost sure. opportunity. So I'd have to see the casting and all that, but just leave it alone. Yeah. Touching on what you said earlier about it would hurt ticket sales, I think yeah. um, making a feature film out of a Broadway show is a great way to reach a wider audience and get people into musical theater that yeah. might not otherwise have 
entertained that. Well, in some ways, it's almost a commercial for the theatrical I mean, performance. Yeah. I mean, yes, we see it, and you you get all that. You're going to bring more revenue into it, and you're going to reach another audience to not only get into musical theater, but to appreciate it. You know, mm -hmm. even if they don't want to become an actor or this or that, they they'll add it to their lexicon of popular culture of what they like. And yeah. yes, I 100% agree. And they had a chat. I don't know. Like I said, Les Mis took forever to come out. Miss yeah. Saigon took forever. But I would like if they were going to do it. I still think that uh, Phantom of the Opera is one of the better adaptations from a movie musical standpoint. It's not my favorite musical. I love it. But what they did was they've just very much stayed true to the show yeah. and just put it on film, enhanced it in ways that they could. But, you know, like I said, Les Mis, it was an interesting idea, but it is hard for me to ever go back and really sit down and watch it because it's just faces pretty much the whole time and yeah that's i think that there's something that gets lost from yeah. from seeing it live and seeing a show especially with an ensemble cast like les mis yeah because you have that epic thing on the stage that epic look so when you come so intimately you're missing mm -hmm. the epic parts of it where it's it's a very visual opportunity that's lost because of you want to try this technique and i didn't mind the live singing all that it was just it's hard I for me to. I loved the live singing. Yeah, I, I think I think they did a. I, like I said, I, they weren't perfect the voices, but they had a certain charm or quality that made sense to the role, and it's kind of like, well, I wish that it had been just pulled away sometimes, use the same voice and all that, but like show the whole scene, you know. That point is exactly why Miss Patty Lapone is very against turning shows into movies. Which point about the about um, like the close ups and like yeah focusing like so acutely instead of seeing the whole production on a stage right right she, she's against it yeah I love Patty so, Lapone we're in good company we love you Patty Lapone <laughs> we do if you haven't checked check out her Roses Gypsy finale uh, Roses turn it is insanely beautiful and insane and in all the insanely beautiful ways it should be <laughs> insane and uh, everything she's in I just love her but. All right, well, I think that's uh, that pretty much wraps it up. We, you know, we just were big fans of shows. It is the part of the foundation of our friendship, and I will always be grateful for that. And the music, it touches you in a way that just not every medium or art form can. And I'm really glad that we got to see these shows. I'm glad you finally got to see Miss Saigon. Like I said, we bonded on Les Miss, so when she hadn't seen Miss Saigon, I was always like, what? And we appreciate it. But what are some of your favorite shows? Have, are you seeing this cast of for the Les Mis tour or Miss Saigon tour? What are some of your favorite movie musicals? What are some musicals that you wish hadn't been made in movies? And what do you think about Ellen and her song? I know there, I know there are people out there that have an opinion about this. Thanks for joining me, Meg. Thank you. This is 411 Pop Culture, where real people talk about really everything. Thanks. Very like, and I'm all alone. <laughs>